Thank you for tuning in to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah, and I am excited to be hosting this podcast and talking about books. Today, we'll be talking about three books that I have grouped together in the loosest sense, simply because each book takes place in England. The three books we'll be talking about today are Horton Halfpot by Tom Engelberger, The Maisie Dobbs Series by Jacqueline Winspear, and Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. I'm your host, Sarah, and I love to read. I would rather read than almost any other activity. In fact, if I could read while doing other activities, I would be so happy. So, for instance, if I could crochet and read, great. You can do some things. You know, you can work out occasionally and read, depending on what you're doing. But most of the time, you know, you can't just be at work all day reading a book. My mom says, actually, that when I was a kid, in the summer, she would make me take my book outside to read so that at least I was getting a little fresh air, a little sunshine. And then I got the best of both worlds. I got to be out in the fresh air, and I got to spend time with characters and traveling places that I'd never been, going different places in my imagination. It was wonderful, and I still have that love of reading, that love of entering into a character's experiences. So because of that, I'm excited to have been given this opportunity to host a podcast and talk about one of my great loves. I'm not necessarily going to talk about the latest bestsellers or the newest books that are out there. I'm just going to talk about the books and authors that I've loved and enjoyed throughout my life. I'm going to try and hit on a variety of genres and a variety of age groups. In fact, I, I come from a family of readers. I have nieces that age in that range in age from 5 to 19, so we cover the whole gamut there. And we're always sharing our favorite authors, our new favorite books, and so I can get a I hopefully will cover a genre or a style of writing that you also enjoy. In fact, this first book that I'm going to talk about was recommended to me by my mom when I was home the last time. I don't remember if it was my brother or one of my nieces who originally loaned it to her, but then she told me how hilarious it was, and so, of course, I had to check it out. The book is called Horton Halfpot, or The Fiendish Mystery of Smugwick Manor, or The The Loosening of Milady Luggertuck's Corset by Tom Engelberger. Now, the title alone should tell you that it's going to be entertaining. It's going to be a little different. It's going to be tongue-in-cheek. The book is listed as being for middle-grade readers, but I personally loved reading it as an adult, and I also think it would be really fun to read either to or with younger children. I think it's a book for the whole family. It's a chapter book, um, but it does have pictures at the beginning of each chapter, so you do get some illustrations. In fact, the author, Engelberger, is also the illustrator. And in that way, it reminded me a lot in both its writing style and its artistic style of another author that I love, Roald Dahl. The book is described in this way. Tom Engelberger's latest, loopiest, middle-grade novel begins when Milady Luggertuck loosens her corset. It's never been loosened before, thereby setting off a chain of events in which all of the strict rules of Smugwick Manor are abandoned. When, as a result of the loosening, the precious family heirloom, the Luggertuck lump, quite literally a lump, goes missing, the Luggertucks look for someone to blame. Is it Horton Halfpot, the good-natured but lowly kitchen boy who can't tell a lie, or one of the many colorful cast members in this silly romp of a mystery? So that's the description of the book. And the book begins almost immediately with that loosening of Milady Luggertuck's corset, which is pretty funny. I mean, the book starts off with a description of um, female undergarments. But when Lady Luggertuck decides one day to tell her lady's maid, Crotty, not to tighten her corset as much as she normally does, things begin to happen. With the loosening of Milady Luggertuck's corset, things around the Luggertuck Manor, or Smugwick Manor, begin to come undone as well. The servants sense the loosening, and the normally strict rules are begun to get bent more and more. And then the the Luggertuck lump. They think it's an uncut diamond, but it looks, they keep describing it as, it looks like a potato. So it's the the Luggertuck lump, and it gets stolen. And so there's this mystery as to who stole it. How will they get it back? Why was it stolen? It's into this scenario that we then meet Horton, a lowly kitchen boy who works incredibly hard for his meager pay in order to support his family. 
And Horton is surrounded by his three stable hand friends who are always described as smelling of manure. You get a lot of um, kind of boy jokes in terms of manure smell and bathroom humor. He's also surrounded by a motley assortment of other servants, all of whom deal with the loosening in different ways. So Horton is soon in the middle of events set loose, yes, pun intended, by Milady's corset. He becomes involved in a series of events ranging from a little silly to somewhat dangerous, and he handles all of them with aplomb. Horton himself is actually kind of the straight man of the book. He is kind, he's loyal and compassionate, and he follows his own sense of strict ethics. He's very honest. In fact, even when the other servants are feeling the loosening and kind of bending the rules a little bit, Horton remains loyal. He remains loyal to his employers, even though they don't deserve it. And it's the rest of the characters who orbit around Horton who act in hilarious way, in ways that are hilarious or crazy or mean or selfish that serve to highlight Horton's character. The book is, it's ridiculous and it's hilarious. It touches on themes like um, class differences in Victorian England, but it does so in such an endearing and funny way that you don't feel like you're being hit over the head with them. You just know that there are some very obvious differences between the lugger tucks and their household help that lead to a variety of injustices. So you see how the lugger tucks, the lugger tucks have this amazing manner. They have all of these, all of these clothes and jewels and horses, etc. But they pay their servants very poorly. They treat their servants very poorly. But it's all done with kind of humor and in a way that you see the differences, but you're not, as I said, hit over the head of them head with them this book touches on a lot of themes like friendship honesty loyalty of being kind of what it means to be a true friend of what it means to be a family member an angle book writes the book from the perspective of a very opinionated narrator who not only tells the story but then gives snarky asides and backstory so when he's talking about milady luggertuck he always says he always refers to these books that he's supposedly written. Please see Milady Luggertuck and XYZ. So he refers, he makes references to the supposed other books and he makes references to backstories and like inside jokes that you kind of get, but you kind of don't. So the narrator is very involved, very personal. He has comments on everyone's characters and he just makes everything kind of funny and snarky and silly. In fact, this book pretty much has something for everyone. It has mystery, it has humor, it has pirates, landlocked pirates. They lost their ship and they're in the middle of England with no ship. But uh, the captain still threatens to make people walk the plank, which I think is awesome. It has costume balls and it even has pickle eclairs. Ew. Just take a moment to contemplate pickle eclairs. I don't think it's something that I'm going to be putting on my dessert menu anytime soon. And so as you contemplate pickle eclairs, we are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking about a series of books about a British woman named Maisie Dobbs. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back again to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. My next choice is actually a series of books rather than just one book. It's by author Jacqueline Winspear. 
The series uh, begins actually following World War I, so we've moved ahead in time from where Horton Half Pot was in Victorian England. The books begin following World War I, and they follow a young woman named Maisie Dobbs. Actually, this series was recommended to me by a dear friend who also loves to read and who has excellent taste in books. I put out a plea one day on Facebook saying, I need something to read, I need something kind of light, not too heavy, something engaging, and she came through with the Maisie Dobbs series, and even better, it's a series, which means I get lots and lots of books, not just one. I haven't actually read the entire series yet. I've read the first few books. Uh, They're still coming out. The most recent one came out in March of this year. I think it's number 12. But I'm thoroughly enjoying them so far. And I'm happy that there are more to read, more to read because I have a hard time letting go of characters to which I've become attached. And I'm enjoying Maisie, and I'm really glad that I get more books in which to enjoy her. So this is according to the author's website. I'll tell you a little bit more about Maisie Dobbs. Maisie Dobbs, psychologist and investigator, began her working life at the age of 13 as a servant in a Belgravia mansion, only to be discovered reading in the library by her employer, Lady Rowan Rowan Compton. Fearing dismissal, Maisie is shocked when she discovers that her thirst for education is to be supported by Lady Rowan and a family friend, Dr. Maurice Blanche. But the Great War intervenes in Maisie's plans. And soon after commencement of her studies at Girton College, Cambridge, Maisie enlists for nursing service overseas. So in this brief description, you get a lot of information. You understand that Maisie starts her life as a servant in employment to a lord and a lady, Lord and Lady Compton. So we again have those class issues. But she's a servant who has a a quest for knowledge. She has a keen mind, a keen curiosity. And so... She starts sneaking into the library to read all the books when she's off duty. And, you know, of course, in the course of books, she gets caught. But it turns out that Lady Compton is a huge proponent of women's rights. She's a huge proponent of education. And she she gets Maisie connected with her friend, Dr. Maurice Blanche, who then trains Maisie, who gives her education. She's still doing her normal household chores, but she's also working with Dr. Blanche. And she gets accepted into Girton College, Cambridge, but then World War I breaks out. Maisie, uh, in fact, lies about her age at this point. She's only 17. She lies about her age so that she's able to enter the war effort as a nurse. Now, we first encounter Maisie in 1921, I mean 1929. So the war is over. She's finished working with her friend and her mentor, Maurice, and she's actually opened her own investigation agency. She's gone off on her own. She's been working with her mentor, and now he's semi-retired, and she's opened her own agency. The books are mysteries, but they also have a bit of a supernatural element in the way that Maisie uses her unique abilities. If you notice in the beginning of that description, Maisie is listed as a psychologist and an investigator. So part of the way she approaches cases is to try to get more than just the bare black and white facts of the case. She is just as interested in the people in the cases, the feelings that those people have, the circumstances that led up to the case, what people are feeling, how they're reacting, how being involved in the case closing might help them, heal them, etc. In fact, she tries to help and heal people just as much as she tries to solve the more tangible issues of the case that they've hired her for. And Maisie is actually also very in tune with the spiritual world. She isn't psychic per se. Notice that she's listed as a psychologist, not a psychic. But she is aware that there are things in life that aren't explained by straight science. Uh, As part of her studies, she studied meditation. She studied meditation techniques. She's, She's very in tune to the world around her. She follows facts, and she's very concise in the way that she follows a case. But she also is very aware of her own instincts, of her gut instincts, and where those instincts are leading her in the investigation. She's very aware of things like coincidence and how things tie together and why she's being led down a certain path at a certain point in her life. And so why I love these books is because Maisie, as a character, is interesting, she's relatable, and she's an imperfect heroine, which I always appreciate. 
I don't always agree with everything she thinks or feels or does, which, you know, is good because who wants perfect agreement all of the time? But I love that she is fiercely dedicated to her job. She's loyal to her friends and her family, and she's pretty awesome in terms of a woman at her t- in her time. So as I mentioned, the series starts in 1929 and then moves into the 30s. It possibly goes further. I mean, as I said, I haven't looked, I haven't read them all and I haven't looked ahead because I don't want spoilers. I will never give you spoilers and I hope that I don't get spoilers either. Um, So at this point, we know that women had been involved in the war effort, both at home and abroad. Maisie herself was in France as a nurse, but we know that many women worked at home doing the jobs left by the men when they went overseas, when they were deployed. But then after the war, when the men came home, the women, of course, were expected to quit working and become wives and mothers. But Maisie defies these conventions. She's almost 30 and single. (gasps) I know. She owns her own business, and it's a business that is in a realm traditionally defined by men, but she is in there. She's kicking butt. She's taking names. And I also love the series because I'm getting to read about a period that I don't necessarily know a lot about. So it's after World War I. It's getting into the economic depression. When I think of the 30s, I think of the depression here in the U.S. because, of course, that's where I live, and that's what I studied in school more. So I'm fascinated into this glimpse into pre-British life, or into, into, so I'm fascinated by this glimpse into British life post-World War I, and then moving into this time as the economy is starting on a downturn in Europe, we begin to see the rise of Hitler's party in Germany, so I'm interested to see it from a different point of view. Maisie, as a character, is complex, she's constantly growing, um, In high school, I mean, I'm sorry, in college, I was a history major with a women's studies minor. So this is right down my alley. I loved stories, especially of women, men too, but I love personal stories of women in certain places and times. And so I love watching Maisie as a character in this time and this place. Her character is complex and she's constantly growing. As I've said, she was a nurse during the war, having lied about her age to go. And she does not come home unscathed. Um, She saw a lot. She experienced a lot. And part of my love of her character is just watching her growth as she works through some of that post-traumatic stress disorder. They didn't call it that then, but she's working through that. She's working through her memories of the war. She's working through some survivor guilt. And she's beginning to navigate her new life, growing and changing and trying to relegate the past with her new life. And then beyond that, and this is going to come across as maybe a little shallow, but I personally love the descriptions of the clothes in the book. It's the 30s, so Maisie wears a lot of hats, and she wears a lot of T-strap shoes. And um, I enjoy every little detail about Maisie's wardrobe, from those hats to her clothes to her shoes to the kind of bags and wraps and accessories she puts on with everything. And she has a friend named Priscilla who has fabulous clothes so it's just fun again maybe a little shallow but that's okay Maisie is intelligent she's imperfect and she's stubborn so she's definitely my kind of heroine as I said there are about 12 books currently in this series I think the most recent was just published in March of this year so this makes me extremely happy because it means that I have a lot more of Maisie to enjoy so if you're a fan of historical fiction if you're a fan of strong female leads uh, if you're a fan of mysteries um, then these are great books you should check them out it's the Maisie Dobbs series again by Jacqueline Winspear We have to take one more quick break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about one of my favorite period pieces, um, British literature, sometimes abbreviated as Brit Lit. We're going to talk about Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest.
Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. So, our first two books, Horton Half Pot by Tom Engelberger and the Maisie Dobbs series by Jacqueline Winspear, though they were written for very different audiences, for very different genres, uh, they both have their story setting of England in common. Um, both were written in the present time about times in the past. So, of course, Horton Half Pot in the Victorian era and then Maisie Dobbs in the 1930s. And as I mentioned before the break, my next choice in books is Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, which was written in 1847. So it's not written currently. It's about a specific period, but it was written closer to that period. So it's not historical fiction, but rather a book about a specific place and time written nearer to that time and place, written by a female author. It's set during the reign of George III, who ruled from 1760 to 1820. Um, So since this was published in 1847, it's not exactly concurrent, but it's a lot closer than if it was written as historical fiction. It was actually originally published as the autobiography of Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, but it's not an autobiography. So Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte is a book that I fell in love with in high school. It wasn't required reading. I don't even remember why I decided to read it. Uh, I think I was going through a... Jane Austen, Charlotte Bronte kind of phase. Other girls I knew were reading these books, and so I wanted to read them as well. Um, The book is written in the first person, so as the reader, we see everything through Jane's eyes, through the lens of her thoughts and her emotions. Um, Jane, in many ways, is typical of heroines of her time. We first meet her when she is living with her aunt and maternal uncle, Um, She was orphaned as a baby, and then her maternal uncle's family took her in, but they don't treat her well. Um, She's an outsider. Uh, The the biological children of the couple are very spoiled. The aunt is very resentful of Jane's place in her household. Um, So typical of books of this genre this time, she's treated very poorly, Um, And eventually they just get tired of having her around, so they ship her off to boarding school. And, of course, boarding school, unfortunately, isn't much better. Um, The principal, some of the teachers are horrible. Um, It's cold, it's dark, it's dreary. One of her only friends dies. Uh, This is all in the beginning of the book, so I'm not really giving giving away too many spoilers. But at least there are – there is one teacher – who does appreciate Jane and gives her words of encouragement. So there are a few bright spots in Jane's life. Thankfully, there is this small measure of kindness extended to her. And despite everything in her life, you could, you could understand if Jane grew up to be bitter, resentful, angry, revengeful even. Instead, she matures into a quiet but kind and passionate young woman. She's always described as rather plain, but she grows up into a good woman. And in fact, she ends up teaching at the school for a while, which I always find intriguing because she seems so miserable there for a long time. But then she finds her place. She finds that she enjoys teaching. Um, But then when her, her favorite teacher, the one that I spoke of earlier who encouraged her, gets married and leaves, Jane decides it's also time for her to leave, to branch out. And so she applies to be a governess, and she is um, she ends up being employed at Thornfield Hall by Mr. Rochester. Actually, it's Mrs. Fairfax, his housekeeper, who hires me, who hires Jane. But she's employed by Mr. Rochester at Thornfield Hall as the governess to his ward, a young French girl whose name is Adele. And so. Jane ends up at Thornfield, and at first we don't really see much of Mr. Rochester. It's mostly Jane and Mrs. Fairfax, the housekeeper, and then Adele, who she does grow to be very fond of. They have a very sweet kind of loving relationship as Jane instructs her and is her governess. Um, But of course, Mr. Rochester does eventually come home. He and Jane have an awkward kind of um, funny sort of Victorian meeting like they always do in books like this um we get your sort of typical twists and turns of books of this period mr Gr- mr rochester as a character is grumpy he is angry and bitter and sarcastic and i think if i had to spend any amount of time with him i would want to kick him but we find out through the course of the book 
why he is the way he is. And if you've read the book, then you know. Uh, I won't give anything away. But we're introduced to a man who who seems to hate his life. He's fed up with most of the people around him. He doesn't want to be at home. He travels a lot. He works too much. And yet he and Jane developed develop something of a rapport. Despite their many differences, his less than stellar personality and her quietness, they develop a friendship and they find that they can have conversations and despite his sarcastic comments, she perseveres and gives as good as she gets. And then there are, of course, the usual twists and turns with um, female characters who want to marry Mr. Rochester because he is rather wealthy. And uh, these these characters are, again, terrible to Jane due to her class and her supposed plainness. Um, they go out of their way, especially one who wants to marry Mr. Rochester, uh, to make her feel as horrible as possible. But Jane perseveres, as she always does. And there's also a bit of a mystery at Thornfield. It it does, again, come to light, and it plays into Mr. Rochester's personality. Um, It plays a major part in the twists and turns that this story takes. And so, as I said, if you haven't read it, I'm not going to give it away, but it definitely tests the strength of Jane's character and her her resolve to live the life that she's determined to live. She, like uh, Horton Halfpot, like Maisie Dobbs, has a very specific set of of ethics, a very specific way of living. She uh, talks about her Christian faith and how that shapes her life. And so I know this book isn't to everyone's liking because it's written in 1847 in England. Um, It has a certain way of writing. The prose can tend to be a little florid. Uh, You sometimes feel like you're wading through the words a little bit. But at its heart, at least to me, Jane Eyre is the story of a woman who is defined by her time and her circumstances, and yet both because of and in spite of those circumstances, she manages to live life on her own terms. Despite heartache, despite everything that happens to her, she manages to stick to her own sense of ethics, to her own, her own principles. And at a time when women had really very little to say about their own life and about their own decisions— and, you know, Jane has her share of that with her horrid family, she still manages to forge a path to stay within those principles and to live the life that she chooses. She does, of course, encounter hardships and obstacles, but she meets them with the same sense of calm purpose that she does with everything. And in so doing, then she forms strong and lasting bonds with the people that she lets into her life. She has these wonderful relationships with a few people in her life. And like the writing style, I don't think Jane and Rochester are going to be characters that are to everyone's taste. You know, Jane is fairly quiet, fairly unassuming. Rochester is that grumpy, brooding, generally unlikable character. And yet I actually kind of love them because they are flawed. They are representative of regular people living their lives, trying to deal with things. You know, we aren't always perfect. We're quiet. We're grumpy. We're sarcastic. And the book then touches on ideals about love and passion. And despite their reserved and unapproachable natures, both Jane and Rochester are deeply passionate at heart, and they develop this relationship with each other. So this is one of those books that I revisit every every few years. Um, I either read it or I listen to it on audiobook because I love it so much. I also um, will watch movies of Jane Eyre when they come out. I don't think I've seen the most recent one. Um, I think there was one that came out a few years ago that I haven't seen, but my favorite is actually a miniseries that came out in 2006. Um, Jane Eyre is played by Ruth Wilson, and Mr. Rochester is played by Toby Stevens. You may know him from Black Sails, which my husband watches, and which is very strange for me to see Mr. Rochester playing a pirate captain, but that's a subject for a different day. Um, Suffice it to say, I love Jane Eyre love reading it, love watching the movies, just love it in general. I'm not as fond of the other Bronte sisters. Um, You will not be getting a podcast on Wuthering Heights because I hated Wuthering Heights. Again, that's a topic for another day. And this is all the time that we have for today. So you're spared my rant about the other Bronte sisters and their books. So thank you for joining me in my exploration today of these three rather different genres of books. 
I hope you had as much fun as I did. I hope you weren't quite as um, nervous and terrified as I was on my first podcast. Hopefully you weren't just listening, but don't forget that you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and learn more about the GSMC Podcast Network at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. And I hope you will join me again next week as we discuss more books. And in the meantime, you yourself should go get lost in a good book. Thank you.